Good day, everyone. I am Sean Harper, immediate past president of the American Educational Research Association. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 AERA Distinguished Lecture. Our speaker and I both are joining you from Los Angeles, the native, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Gabrielino and Tonga peoples. Selecting the scholar to deliver this address is an enormous presidential perk. There's only one of these lectures each year, and only one person gets selected to deliver it. I therefore imagine that most AERA presidents find this to be an extremely difficult decision. It was not for me. Perhaps this short story will help you understand why this was such an obvious choice for me during my AERA presidency. Our first year assistant professor called UCLA Professor Sylvia Hurtado on her office phone. She answered. He said, you don't know me, but I read and have been deeply influenced by your Journal of Higher Education article on campus racial climates. He went on to explain that her ideas and findings had greatly inspired him to engage in the study of campus climate. He then boldly asked if she would be willing to co-author a paper with him on the topic using some qualitative data he had recently collected. Without even asking to see the data, she generously agreed. That was 16 years ago. I was that bold assistant professor. The paper that resulted from that spontaneous and courageous phone call to Sylvia and her generous response to it is now my second most cited publication. It was the springboard to my own research on campus racial climate. Here at the USC Race and Equity Center, which I founded and direct, we have developed the National Assessment of Collegiate Campus Climates. That survey would not exist. It would not be such a powerfully useful tool to colleges and universities all over the country had it not been for those incredibly pioneering ideas that Sylvia published in that Journal of Higher Education article that inspired me when I was a graduate student. Let me tell you more about our speaker. Sylvia Hurtado is a professor of education in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. She directed the UCLA Higher Education Research Institute for more than a decade and was previously a tenured professor at the University of Michigan. She has written extensively on diverse students' college experiences, indeed on campus racial climate, on improving STEM pathways for underrepresented groups, and a range of other topics pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion in higher education. Incontestably, hers is the most powerful and influential voice on DEI in higher education. Locally, there at UCLA, she has been so incredibly influential in campus policies to advance DEI, including uh, the most recent uh, outcome of uh, the, the, the policy around uh, testing and uh, test optional admissions. But her reach has extended so far beyond UCLA. As a matter of fact, it has extended all around the globe, as Sylvia is indeed a global scholar on the topics that she studies. She has directed multi-million dollar National Institutes of Health funded projects to study the long-term effects of undergraduate education and diversification on the scientific workforce. Sylvia has published in all of the most highly respected journals in her field. Uh, she is one of the most cited scholars in the field of higher education. Two of Professor Hurtado's books won International Latino Book Awards. The first is Hispanic Serving Institutions, Advancing Research and, Transform and Transformative Practice, which was published by Routledge. And the other was The Magic Key, The Educational Journey of Mexican Americans from K-12 to College and Beyond, which was published by the University of Texas Press. Professor Hurtado was rightly inducted into the National Academy of Education in 2019 
She is an AERA fellow. In 2018, AERA presented her as Social Justice and Education Award. And in 2015, she received the AERA Division J Exemplary Research Achievement Award. Sylvia is a past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education. She earned a bachelor's degree from Princeton, a master's degree from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and her PhD from UCLA. Please, as you listen to Professor Hurtado's mind-blowing, provocative, incredible talk, uh, do feel free to uh, engage by uh, posing questions for her uh, using the Q&A icon. Uh, please, no comments, only questions. Uh, we have a colleague whom I will introduce later in the experience who will pose uh, your questions uh, to Professor Hurtado. So please, if you have questions uh, throughout the talk, uh, do be sure to use the Q&A function. Without further ado, it is my enormous president, immediate past presidential privilege um, to introduce to you the 2021 AERA Distinguished Lecturer, Professor Sylvia Hurtado. Thank you, Sean uh, Harper, um, for that generous introduction. And to AERA for the honor and opportunity to give the 2021 Presidential Distinguished Lecture. The association is a great organization with extremely talented people committed to education and equity. Therefore, I'm greatly humbled to offer this talk. The viral pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism have revealed the inequalities that have, we have long ignored. I want to first extend empathy for the deaths due to COVID-19, which have most significantly affected African-American, Latinx, and Native American communities, as well as the deaths of African-Americans as a result of police brutality. Also, Latinx families that were targets of the mass shooting of El Paso in El Paso, Texas last year, and to Asian Americans who were the targets of mass shooting in Atlanta. These racial ethnic identity groups have endured racial profiling. They are the targets of increasing hate crimes and on a daily basis are often viewed not as individuals, but as a faceless mass. I want to personalize facelessness, use research on campus racial climates, and articulate how our tendencies for recognition bias are perpetuated and reinforced at the individual and institutional levels. I will then articulate the need for identity-based education and change in higher education. In intergroup dialogue, we call this naming, framing, and taming. But much of what social justice educators and researchers do is actually reframe. If racial bias is inevitable, then finding ways to dismantle racism rather than simply taming it is essential for individuals, institutions, and the policies and practices that we construct. Many researchers that study microaggressions and racism in education settings have done a fine job of naming these experiences among multiple social identity groups. I want to speak about a common form of racial bias that occurs in an instant, and it is reinforced systemically. Recognition bias is when members of a particular racial group are often mistaken for another person of the racial group, or that may be of a different ethnicity. All racial groups share this tendency for recognition bias, but research suggests that the effect is most pronounced for white individuals when viewing racial ethnic groups. Researchers say the cross race effect is a tendency for recognition accuracy to be better for same race spaces than for cross race spaces. Two hypotheses explain this recognition bias, and both may be operative. The first is a lack of familiarity, contact, or perception expertise with specific racial groups to recognize heterogeneity and individual differences. A second hypothesis is that we have a natural tendency towards social categorization. 
developing a preference for the in-group and low regard for out-groups, and in some cases, demonizing out-groups. You can easily imagine from an intergroup relations lens how low cross-race recognition leads to implicit bias, fuels hate crimes, and practices such as racial profiling. Even the creation of facial recognition software that fails to differentiate individuals within specific racial groups stems from a developer's own recognition bias. Systemic racism also perpetuates individual tendencies for recognition bias. For example, de facto racial segregation leads perceivers to have differential expertise in processing same race versus cross race faces, which then leads to differential recognition inaccuracy, as researchers say. I offer my own recognition bias story as an example. As a kid growing up in a Texas city segregated by race and class, Mexicans on the west side, blacks on the east side, unless you worked for the military, then you were on one of five military installations or on the base. White people were on the north side, unless you were poor, then you might be on the southwest side of town. I celebrated my Mexican identity, five generations on the same land that changed government control. And although my mother's family may have been granted citizenship as part of a treaty, we were also fully aware that we were not white. We were always Mexicanos. Even today, two thirds of Latinx regard their Hispanic background as part of their racial background, not something separate. In the 1960s, I recall my family sat at the back of the Greyhound bus and could drink only from the Mexican water fountains on stops during a trip to Shreveport, Louisiana to help my sister after the birth of my niece. I attended the predominantly Mexican high school next door. College was the first time I encountered and learned about many other social identity groups with a Jewish roommate, a Puerto Rican roommate, and even a roommate who was related to the Massachusetts colonists that were religious refugees. Pilgrims or Puritans I thought were mythical. I was among the first group of Latinas, five, that were admitted to Princeton from the same city that year. Before that, pioneering Latinas, like now Justice Sonia Sotomayor, had been admitted mostly from East Coast towns and cities. It was a time when elite colleges were opening their doors to women and previously excluded groups. I also learned in college that my predominantly Mexican school district was identified as the poorest in the state of Texas in the Rodriguez school finance case. I experienced the resource differences created by state systems that perpetuate unequal system uh, schooling. It became evident to me when students in my biology class said that they had the same text in high school. The competition for grades rewarded students for what they already knew, not what they had learned, at least in the first year. That was a rude awakening to the inequality that I faced in college, but it also fueled what would become later a research agenda. Growing up in a segregated residential and school environment meant I was not aware of some of the biases I had or that others had about Latinas. For example, at Thanksgiving break, the first few months of college, I decided to join a ride share and drive back to my home with a group of students traveling to the South ending in my hometown. The four of us piled into the car that morning and did not stop until we hit a city for lunch. We got separated somehow, so I was the last to get through the lunch line. And when I turned to find my fellow students, all I saw was a sea of white faces. I tried to remember some of their distinctive features, but I saw none in this crowd. I was embarrassed that I could not tell white people apart. So I found an empty seat and sat by myself. Then I heard one of them call out, inviting me to come sit with them. It was easy for them to spot me. I was the only person of color. I was relieved. They probably thought that I was sitting alone because we were still strangers. But I studied their faces for the rest of the drive and ask questions about their upbringing and background. Now I can name that experience due to research. 
and I took classes where I learned more about race, ethnicity, immigration, and religion in college. I now know that I was trying to overcome my own recognition bias. I also know that, was an, that I was an other to the majority on campus, that I was exotic according to the high school students I taught in New Jersey, and they knew nothing about my background or experiences. These college experiences motivated me to study campus racial climates and begin to document the experiences that were unique, unique, but also shared experiences of marginality. In writing about the campus racial climate, we started with the premise that students grow up and are educated in racialized contexts. We set out to capture the institutional racial climates and document its impact on students. And we intentionally feature the work of researchers that have used the perspectives of various racial ethnic groups that reflect their marginization and in recognizing them, both the populations and the researchers, we began to capture the multiple realities that coexist in educational environments, consequently shaping intergroup dynamics that reflect the racial climate on campus. Over time, Conducting campus climate studies, I found the patterns of racial groups repeated over time. They were quite predictable, similar from campus to campus, all evidence of more systemic issues. We saw significant difference, differences with fewer perceived hostile or exclusionary climates when the proportions of African-American, Latinx, and American Indians reached a point of better representation, now referred to as a critical mass. When students are one of a few, these racial groups are highly visible or individuals within racial groups, and they report poor climates. When there are many students from similar race and ethnicity, they are more comfortable in choosing who to associate with. But now we're beginning to find that despite their numbers, they remain invisible to those who fail to differentiate them. Studies of Latinx students also revealed heterogeneity in climate experiences. And though their numbers were larger, Mexican Americans had more difficulty in college adaptation compared to other Latinx groups. So group heterogeneity was often ignored, particularly when it comes to ethnic differences. Students on our campus, in our campus climate studies understood when they are not being differentiated attributing this to lack of awareness and invisibility. Those are their words. A common theme in focus groups that expressed in identity groups, except white students that were in the majority. We came to conclude this lack of awareness is a form of white privilege. An Asian American female undergraduate stated in one of our studies, I think one of the basic problems here on this campus is that Asians are taken as a collective group individual experiences and cultural differences between and the complexity of a culture with an Asian and Asian American community is not so much recognized. I think that's a real problem on this campus is that there's no recognition of the experience between, let's say, a Filipino American and a Korean American or a Filipino American and a Pakistani American. I think those experiences are very diverse. An Africa, African American male undergraduate concurred I think that being black at this university, there are two different ways to look at it. There's one, just being black to everyone and to everyone else, you are black. You're not Caribbean, you're not African, you're not African-American, you're just black. Expressing race and ethnic cultural distinctiveness requires educating others. And sometimes students don't bother. Recognition bias is so common. This student alludes to performing one's identity, and we each perform our multiple social identities in different contexts. It's important to note that students are well aware of being treated as just Black, just Asian, or just Latinx. Some use it to their advantage because they understand that others cannot differentiate them. An African, -Amer African American male joked, now see, they, these swimming test supervisors, they can't tell some of these black ethnicities apart. So if you're black, sometimes you get your friend to do the swim test for you. 
sometimes that works because you're bringing the card. They don't know who you are. You're like, hey, I'm Paul. They're like, oh, hey, Paul, go swim. You swim, whatever. <laughs> At this college, everyone even takes a swim test freshman year that has to be passed before graduation. The students know that supervisors have recognition bias. There is no identity-based education and they lack cultural awareness. Now that's something that should be tasted before graduation. After years of studying campus racial climates, I realized the stories I heard continue to echo my own experiences, but decades later, recognition bias happens in classrooms, in interaction with peers, with faculty and staff, it happens on and off campus. You would think when the numbers are small and individuals are highly visible that others would be able to differentiate them. When the numbers increase, there is even more of a tendency toward recognition bias and sometimes reinforced by institutions. Institutions often use aggregated data to track student progress. Using a category like URM may seem harmless, but it renders large groups like Latinx and smaller groups like Native Americans invisible. Even worse, campuses collect data on Native and Pacific Islanders, Native Americans and Pacific Islanders, and then do not report it because of the small sample sizes. This reinforces their invisibility and assures that specific practices will not be initiated toward assisting these groups. Students and their specific racial and ethnic identities are erased. There are several disturbing revelations about recognition bias. First, it appears that it's not only based on socialization or lack of meaningful contact experiences, but our brains may be wired for it. We have to become more cognizant and knowledgeable of differences within racial groups, train ourselves and train others to see, listen, appreciate, and learn and give students an opportunity to share their salient identities. We have to create mutual learning environments for us to break our own tendencies for bias and help others do the same. That is why I appreciate Ibram Kendi's notion that becoming anti-racist is a lifelong project. As students at one of our campus visits set a higher bar for us stating that we must become actively anti-racist. Instead of saying, I am not a racist, or institutions proclaiming this is not who we are when yet another racial incident occurs. Second, recognition bias is not a reportable discriminatory act unless it is escalated to violence. In our studies, only about 10 to 11 percent of any uh, students report any kind of racial discrimination on campus to a campus authority. That is, it's not reported. African Americans reports are double that of the general population, but surveys also revealed when asked specifically about exclusion or forms of discrimination, specific forms, it's much higher for minoritized groups, ranging from 30 to 40%, depending on the type of bias that we're monitoring. So going only on reports to campus authorities, campuses are looking at the tip of the iceberg. Even in the most diverse campuses, forms of bias and exclusion were still reported by students, though reports were lower than the least diverse campuses. Third, we often fail to make the connection between individual forms of bias and systemic conditions. Even in our dialogues or dialogue courses, we have to make an extra effort so that students can make the links with systemic forms of discrimination as reinforced by policies. We should study individual bias and also establish more links with contextual, contextual forms of systemic racism linking macro and micro stem systems of oppression in the way I uh, try to do with my personal story. Finding ways to capture bias and exclusion and link it with other forms of various levels helps us to understand broader context and dynamics between individual and systemic forms of bias and exclusion. Most of what we know about recognition bias research-wise comes from psychology experience, experiments. Some stories from qualitative and qualitative uh, assessments and rarely from surveys. In preparing research for the University of Michigan Affirmative Action case, we posited a theory of diversity in learning that established 
the value of diverse peers and those interactions in classrooms as opportunities to learn, to encourage more effortful thinking and move away from stereotypes and embedded worldviews when interactions were positive. But we underestimated the inertia that comes from strong tendencies for social categorization and bias at both the individual and systemic level. In any case, recognition bias dehumanizes individuals from specific racial and ethnic groups. In a word, we render individuals faceless, and it contributes to invisibility felt by members of Asian American and Pacific Islander, African American, Latinx, and Native American groups, as we found in our qualitative studies. Social psychologists would also indicate increased contact and enlightenment, that is John DeVideo's theory, or knowledge about social identity groups are necessary to unlearn prejudice and recognition bias. But because a recognition deficit is shaped and framed by systemic forms of racism, if we wish to recognize and unlearn these cognitive potholes, we have to dismantle the institutional practices and policies that reinforce them. So what should we do? Or what can we do? We cannot assume that the historical legacy of exclusion and segregation has diminished in educational institutions. We cannot assume that resources have been fairly redistributed or even the move towards federal funding for minority serving institutions has addressed the resource differences between institutions. Interventions for student success often reach a small number of students. We need to do more to transform institutions to ensure equity providing more support to the students who need it. Foundation officers at NIH and NSF are looking for broader change solutions that will make differences in the institution and diversifying the STEM workforce. NIH is now seeking input and in ways that they can address systemic racism in their funding and practice guidelines. Further, race neutral policies serve to reinforce inequities that exist not dismantle them. We need anti-racist policies and actively anti-racist practices. This means developing the means to address specific racial groups on campuses, understanding and targeting the unique problems they face. At the classroom level, we are adopting more identity-based or culturally sustaining practices that use activities that help students speak about and reflect on their backgrounds and key identity groups using cultural artifacts and stories. It is easier to remember names and faces when we know about the pride, pain, and conflict associated with their identity. For example, one student I would call Claudia brought an avocado as a cultural artifact. She told the class that her family picked avocados for a living. In an instant, without saying much more, her lesson was memorable. Although we may all think that once arriving in higher education, the students are on equal footing, they are not. And some of them actually overcame great adversity to arrive here. Claudia also reminded all of us that laborers, her family, bring food to our tables every day, and they did so at great risk during the pandemic. Every time I prepare avocado, I think of her family now. Retraining mindsets is important, but it doesn't always lead to changing behavior. We're engaged in an NIH project now with Angela Byers Winston at the University of Wisconsin in faculty development activities to help faculty at research in intensive institutions become culturally aware mentors in science. This training begins with an understanding of the value of social identities. Students must find a way to integrate their social and science identities with important role models. In STEM, students do, do not remove their race or gender and replace it with a lab coat when they enter the lab or begin their mentoring relationships. We are studying individual change and also determining if, resu if that results in greater inclusion and transformation of departmental climates and practices that result in culturally aware mentor training as a result. 
As one African-American colleague stated, when we were working together to make major changes in California admissions eligibility years ago, he said, don't waste the crisis. This historic moment is a window of opportunity to act. The major disruptions of the past two years, I would like to believe, helped us to rethink how we can work to rehumanize our practices. Reaching out as best we could to those who have felt marginalized, using the best we could with it, the technology we learned. We need to continue these efforts so that students and our colleagues feel affirmed, included, and thrive. Thank you for logging in today. I think I'll take some questions. Okay. Uh, Sylvia, the 2021 AERA Distinguished Lecture that you just delivered is as brilliant, as scholarly, as important, and as useful as I knew it would be. Thank you for generously inspiring me when I was a PhD student more than two decades ago. Thank you for engaging with me in such a high impact co-authorship 16 years ago. Thank you for accepting my invitation 10 months ago to deliver today's distinguished lecture. And thank you for being such a terrific role model, mentor, collaborator, supporter, and most importantly, friend. I am always just so mind blown by you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this great lecture. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce George Wimberly, AERA's Director of Professional Development and Chief Diversity Officer, who will present the questions that you all have posed for Dr. Hurtado. If you have not yet submitted your questions, don't panic, there's still time. Just simply uh, click the Q&A icon and type your questions to, to submit them. Dr. Wimberly, thank you for being here. I appreciate everything that you do for AERA. And at this time, I will turn it over to you to pose the first question to Professor Hurtado. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Professor Harper. And I think we can enter our questions. And there, there are several questions that have been coming uh, in the Q&A box, not only, uh, not only questions, but also many people th uh, thanking Professor Hurtado for, for what such a riveting and powerful lecture and sharing information. Thank you for that. I, I just, I, I'm gonna just say, I think I, the lecture has just been, I was on the edge of my seat, really waiting for that, that next moment. <laughs> One of the questions has come, come, has come through. Can you speak to the distinction between recognition bias and prejudice? Um, it's a great question. Um, so a lot of researchers see recognition bias as unintentional. Prejudice is usually intentional. Um, and so when I talk about recognition bias, I, I am also talking about uh, forms of prejudice. As I said, if it's this social categorization with the in-group, out-group, and then demonizing the out-group, there's actually an active intent there. Um, so there are, uh, there are very similar um, it's just that also there's a, a, a branch of research that looks at recognition bias is just people that need more contact and need to be informed. In other words, less, less attached to actively racist uh, intent. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on, another question here. Could you speak a bit to how is it that we can help K-12 students understand bias, microaggressions, and race theories in this sort of this era we're in now where topics like critical race theory are being banned in our K-12 systems? Huh. Yeah, we're in an incredibly, um, I would say, divisive moment. And, um, you know, I always have to sort of think is that beyond, you know, blatant racism, 
I, I think there's a real fear of the other coming through here and understanding that there are alternative ways of being. I mean, it, it actually attacks the very systems of socialization that individuals undergo to unlearn that. And that's what we do in dialogue. We unlearn some of the socializations that are reinforced um, internally and externally within our trusted families, churches, schools, and also from external uh, forms of punishment. So I see this era as trying to impose this uh, punishment for learning about difference. And it, it's so essential. If it were deeply embedded in our practices of teaching and research, I think that we would probably less, um, it would be harder to attack, but it's, it's, it's as if we have not always been making, make these uh, processes implicit in everything we do. Um, in other words, when I, when I start teaching, I immediately recognize who's in the room. And there's a way to, and that's why I kind of call it identity-based, to recognize identities and multiple social identities. I think it's a good tool to use, is that everyone has a social identity and in some conditions, some are sailing and more, and then other conditions, um, some are um, denigrated and there are status differences in these identities. So we learn them. And then I think the natural thing is really you know, we have such an overt history of racism. It's, it's hard to not know it. But very often when we're doing intergroup dialogue, um, students are really changed. They see their eyes opened and then they can't shut them. That's how I hear. This is what I hear from students. Um, because then they see and they're able to recognize oppression and racism, and then see how it's been, it's in their social groups, they see it in the news, and the internet, you can go on in three seconds and find multiple forms of oppression. So, I think we've got to stop denying the reality here. Actually, Sylvia, can I jump in there? Um, you know, a portion of your body of work, I love all of it. Um, one important portion of it focuses on diversity and democracy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about the implications of the attacks on critical race theory and the teaching the truth about America's racial history and slavery and so on? What are the larger threats to our democracy? Yeah, <laughs> we're in the middle of this right now. <laughs> We see it. But if you take even just the notion of the the theory of social categorization is that it's it's in play. You can see it happening. You see how in groups are favored and out groups are demonized. So it's a very it's 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 all in process. And in a recent essay I wrote um, in Daedalus, basically, I I really said um, this was before the January 6th event, I said, we could be at a point of uh, civil war, basically, or it's the kind of thing using examples of other countries that we are at a point where we have, um, we have so much demonized the other side that we cannot even find common goals. And so it's a very, very, our democracy is very vulnerable. And so, but, it, but I, still, I still hold optimism that we can find a way to work together. And maybe, you know, maybe I'm naive or whatever, but I have to be, as an educator, I have to be an optimist. There are things we can learn, there are things we can do. And yeah, it's, Sylvia, for, for sure, you're not naive, that's for sure. But could you talk about what makes you so optimistic during these tough times? Well, I think it's 
this is actually one moment in history. We've been through this before. Mm -hmm. It happens again and again. And so it, it takes different turns. And so, you know, because people forgot, uh, you know, what happened during the Reagan era or what happened in, in some other era, right? And, uh, and, uh, and so I see we can come out on the other side. But it is a bit like making progress, you know, two steps forward, one step back, or maybe further. So I don't know. I, I think I've always been an optimist is that I see it all, but I feel like as an educator, I have to be optimistic and I have to put my trust in the youth of the future because they're going to carry on. And so what we do with them is so important. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Wimberly, I will leave the question asking to you. Okay, great, great. Thank you. There have been a lot of questions around issues around language mm -hmm. and linguistics specifically. Can you speak a bit to some of the, the similarities and differences between language bias and racial bias and how those are having an effect on our campuses today? And sort of a two-part question here, and can multilingualism combat racism? Well, I'm, I'm not a language or literacy scholar, I have to first say. Um, but I know that language is a really important part of cultural distinctiveness. And so for some, language is so important to the preservation of culture, that we have to recognize that value, obviously. Um, and so if we think about, if we do are engaging in cult culturally sustaining practices, that we will use opportunities uh, for reinforcing learning languages or languages lost, recovering them. Um, in other words, preservation of culture is not about white, just white culture is of the many cultures that are part of uh, our society. So language bias is part and parcel of other forms of bias, especially if we're trying to create a more homogeneous um, society or work group. Um, so I think that you know, there are certainly a lot of links there um, between them that are inseparable. So the question about multilingual individuals, well, my first thought was, that's wonderful. They can communicate with many people and th that's good. No question. Um, and I think it's for the global world we work in, very useful to be multilingual. But I also, I mean, my lecture just said, we all, we all still have biases. All of us have biases. So we have to kind of rethink those. Now, multilingual people may be more, you know, make more bridges between different groups, um, perhaps greater understanding. I, I don't know, but we haven't measured, I don't think we've measured the bias or study this in multilingual individuals, but it's certainly an important area to work on. Uh, so yeah, the potential is there. I, I just I just don't know. I mean, we all have biases we have to, as I said, work to unlearn and overcome. Thank you. At, at several points in your talk, you talk you mentioned uh, college admissions and particularly the, the Michigan case. Mm -hmm. What impact do you think factors such as test optional admissions and, and other admissions criteria will have on creating a more equitable and diverse student body on campuses? Sylvia, I'm so glad someone posed this question from the audience 
uh, because I stumbled a bit. Um, I was nervous. I stumbled a bit when I was talking about your leadership at UCLA and across the UCs on this particular issue. So I'm glad that it came back around and that you have an opportunity here to talk more about it. Yeah, well, thank you because uh, we did suspend the use of tests. Now, test optional is not the same thing as suspending the use of tests. Test optional could create more inequities because some students will have them and others will not. So we already know that there are some um, institutions or even departments within institutions that are using the tests that people have been able to take. I think we take them for several years um, old, so some of them were taking them. We suspended the review of all tests in the UC system, and that was, I testified before the regents, uh, but the regents heard and had questions and panels and et cetera, and they made that decision. And what we found immediately, and I'm not sure it happened at every institution, but we found at all of the UCs that the increased numbers of applications went up tremendously. So obviously the tests, and by before that actually, as Sean was, Sean was alluding to earlier, about 10 years ago, we got, we used to have achievement tests as well, which a lot of private selective colleges do have the achievement tests. We, when we eliminated that, the numbers of applicants went extremely high. And the reason is then the tests were a barrier, a filter, just taking the test or having requirement for a test was a barrier filter. So now we're in the process and we had already moved to um, looking at students holistically in terms of admissions. Um, so we all, we had many other factors to consider in, in reviewing files, which is wonderful because we had already been doing that for a while and it was partially response to certainly the uh, 209 proposition, which was uh, banning the use of race or gender in uh, not just admissions, but contracting and other areas. So what we've learned is we've, we've added, the tests were a significant barrier to even thinking about going to a four-year institution or any institution that required tests. We're finding that that was the case. Now, where are we going to go in the future? I don't know. I don't know yet. Uh, that's still being determined, but it seemed like a fair thing to do to just eliminate the test because it was just, there was just no way um, we could ensure integrity and, and to do test optional would have been unequal. Thank you. We know that you've done quite a bit of research on recognition bias. Can you speak a bit to how recognition bias looks at different institutions across the country, such as uh, distinctions between public and private institutions, different parts of the country, um, minority serving institutions? Okay. So, uh I began, I, I talked about recognition bias because it's so hard to detect with our current surveys and measures across institutions. In other words, it's so common that it's not reported, um, though it certainly contributes to a student's feeling of invisibility and, um, and exclusion, typically. So, so that's why I talked about it, because it's one of the hardest things to document and people don't report it. So I couldn't tell you specifically about recognition bias. And I can tell you about campus climates and distinctions. And one of the things that we observed, it's fairly similar patterns again and again. And when the patterning is different, we need to know what else is happening in the environment that the pattern is different. So we know what to expect. We know about what the percentage, when I say the percentage of reporting is only 10 or 11%, it's after many years of asking that question, we know that. So we know it's similar across a lot of institutions. Um, so 
for MSIs, I do want to say something specific is, and that's basically in a lot of the data we actually presented in the Fisher uh, case of uh, affirmative action case at the University of Texas, um, was that um, the data show that for the most part, institutions that are over around 36% uh, underrepresented groups, which are quite diverse or, or greater, that the forms of discrimination and exclusion are lower. In other words, the more diverse, and I say that the issue is students have choices, you know, when the numbers are larger, and very often those large numbers, sometimes they commute, so they don't spend as much time on campus, et cetera, versus the predominantly white campuses, which we had within the zero to 20% range of URM, where much higher uh, form, all forms of exclusion and discrimination were reported by students. So we know that distinction. But as I said in my lecture, it never disappears, even in the most diverse institutions. So there's still forms, and we think part of it may be recognition bias, but there are other lots of other forms of things that happen on campuses that individuals just don't report. And so I think we find, you know, there's so many different kinds of microaggressions that are not reported as well uh, for women as well uh, for women of color and so we're still doing a lot of work in terms of understanding the differences but i have to say public and private i see similar patterns again and again and it's only when they're different that we kind of try to figure out why are they different um, I hope that's helpful. I think that is helpful. Um, George, I know I said I was going to leave the question asking to you, but Sylvia, um, a colleague just sent me a text message <laughs> and asked, is it recognition bias or is it racism? Mm -hmm. uh, it is both. It is both. Um, I just said that recognition bias happens at the individual level, but they're systemic forms, right? So it is both. It's not... What I'm saying is basically they're tied together. <laughs> they're tied together, folks, and it starts here, right? Or here, but it starts here. So let's put it this way. For everything, we should, we should assume, one, that we have biases. We should assume that institutions have practices that probably reinforce bias. Um, so this way, we're not surprised when incidents happen. We are more prepared, right? We know if we have strategies, and that's what we try to do in dialogue, we know these issues are going to break open, conflict's going to happen, conflict's going to get resolved. We could predict this. And, you know, my, my colleague at UMass Amherst, you, Jimena Zuniga, who I hope is listening, she's, she taught me something very important. important. She says, conflict is an opportunity to learn. That was a hard thing, but now my students, you know, I teach them all about these things and then my evaluations say, oh, we didn't have enough conflict in this class. So it's, they're actually seeking ways to try to, they want to get in it. They, they don't want to just learn this theoretically. They want to know how to manage. They want to know how to have these discussions. They want to know how to come out on the other side when there are differences and we can do that. Um, and that's what's so exciting. Uh, about this work, and, and but the thing is, from one dialogue to another, you can you know exactly what's going to come out. <laughs> you know because it's, it happens again and again. So, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, you did. And also, honestly, Sylvia, what you just said is so consistent with what I hear from both my education students and my MBA students in the business school that they actually want more conflict um in the discussions mm -hmm. in the class you know th that is the thing that makes me optimistic right about you know the future and our democracy around around these topics yeah. Yeah, yeah great dr wimberly i think we have time for just one final question okay i i, I think we, we hear one question i want to get to is professor Otato, what advice can you give to graduate students and early career scholars, particularly scholars of color, who are thinking of implementing 
recognition bias into their research agenda and studying this further. Our budding scholars, advice for them. This is great. The thing is, is there is a history of research in this area. It's not something that I've done. I came across it because there were things that could not be explained in the climate studies, but I could see students talking about them and the qualitative data. In other words, our surveys were not capturing them. So yeah, I think it's great to capture the many daily uh, subtle and overt forms of bias that appears and for multiple communities. I think that's so important. Um, you know, I think a big talk, a big part of my talk was how students feel invisible and part of it is not recognizing them or affirming that these incidents are happening or giving them language. That's the great, uh, I would say, advancement of research is we have now language to name these experiences. So if there's research behind it to a large extent, then we know it didn't just happen to me. It didn't just happen to someone I know. This is, this is an area uh, that's part of the phenomenon of who we are as, uh, as, as people living in this society. So, so yeah, I would think it's great. And make sure you make the link though with the systemic because a lot of times people like to center recognition bias only in individuals. And I think the link with the systemic is there. That piece is really important. So if I've started some fire, I'm, I'm very, very happy because it, it was a new thing to think about. And it was part of understanding where, where the, what I call our own cognitive potholes that are a result of more systemic kinds of um, practices. And I didn't even go into many, many more that could have been uh, discussed today. Dolvia, I really appreciate your response to the question. Um, in our final minute or so here, I just want to connect the important question that was posed to an important feature of your work that I've just always really appreciated, and it is the interdisciplinarity of your work. Your work not only reaches across academic fields and disciplines, but it also draws from other fields and disciplines, uh, conceptually, theoretically, but also methodologically. So I think that I would just simply add on to um, the great advice that, that you just gave uh, to early career scholars and to graduate students um, to not just confine yourselves to or restrict your methods to focus groups or individual interviews and surveys, but also like draw on some of those really cutting edge, um, you know, methods techniques that are used in engineering, and in other fields, you know, using like uh, virtual reality and eye scan <laughs> technology and, you know, all of these other things. I, I think that the education yeah. research would benefit from that kind of interdisciplinary innovation. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that because I think in my later years, I really came to realize I was always a mixed method person, but I published mostly the quantitative stuff. As an assistant professor, it's easy to get things out, right? But I think the mixed method, I'm beginning, one of the things I actually am saying in my talk in a way is that these different methods got at some of the problem, but not the entire problem. And so being able to pull in different areas. And then I use stories today, which, you know, I usually have a PowerPoint and lots of data and today was stories, so. Okay. Sylvia, I can't thank you enough. Um, and colleagues who joined from all over the world, thank you for joining for the 2021 AERA Distinguished Lecture. Um, it has been such a great experience. And Sylvia, you have given us so much to think about. You have inspired us in, I think, some sustainable ways. So seriously, thank you so much for the generosity of your presentation today. Everyone, take good care of yourselves. We will look forward to seeing you at the AERA Brown Lecture in October. 
uh, which will be delivered by Ohio State University Professor Lori Patton Davis. Um, and of course, we will look forward to seeing you at the 2022 AERA annual meeting. I know that AERA President Naila Nasir and her team are hard at work. So too is Felice Levine and the AERA staff in delivering a high quality 2022 annual meeting. In the meantime, everyone take good care of yourselves. And once again, thank you for joining.